Thanks for that introduction. Um, some of those acronyms, uh, you know, my office is the Assistive Technology and Accessibility Center. Uh, our acronym is ATAC, and so when JAWS pronounces the acronym, it says the attack. Um, and uh, so we often like to joke that we're attacking in accessibility, um, but I usually don't like to think of it kind of in those kind of violent terms, but you know, it, it is kind of interesting because JAWS says it with such emphasis and often wondered, you know, what would happen if we changed our office's name? We'd lose that. So I know sometimes we kind of struggle with a sense of what the identity from just from how JAWS pronounces our office's acronym. So um, I'm sure most of you uh, just sat through that wonderful presentation. Um, if you weren't already familiar with ARIA, you got a really great introduction to it. Um, I wanted to go ahead and, and put this slide in in case someone sees this presentation kind of out of sequence or, or is just walking in now. But, um, you know, ARIA uh, provides markup essentially and coding practices uh, for making interactive controls um, that otherwise don't exist in regular HTML. Um, so I think as you saw in, in her cases, there were several examples of constructs that extend beyond the model of what and maybe the original HTML uh, had in mind, which I think is, is one of the lovely parts of ARIA is just kind of this promise that you can build new things um, and still make them accessible to a, a wider audience. Um, one of the things when they um, told me I'd be speaking here and they gave me the, the title to this talk actually, um, How to Make ARIA Sing, um, I went back uh, to Wikipedia and I was just doing some other research and I typed ARIA into Wikipedia and it came up uh, of course with its uh, disembobulation page and it, it gave me the definition of ARIA as a musical piece written typically for a solo voice with an orchestral accompaniment in an opera or cantata. And I thought, well, that's actually kind of a great description of ARIA because it builds on so many things and it gives voice to um, a screen reader to kind of describe a lot of the pieces that are out there. Um, so it really relies on a lot of things to put voice uh, to that experience that many of us see so easily with our eyes. Um, so as you may have picked up um, from Leone's presentation, um, there's a lot involved with ARIA. And so what I'm hoping to do in this presentation is kind of give you some senses of where you can go to learn about ARIA, what kind of frameworks you need to start thinking about in your mind in order to use it successfully. Um, you know, so learning to apply the ARIA roles, when do you do it? Um, you know, so she was kind of emphatic about there are obviously cases when you don't want to use it. Um, knowing what users expect when they encounter ARIA is, is kind of a big piece. Um, knowing all those little attributes, she was showing the ARIA controls and um, uh, ARIA hidden and a lot of these different pieces um, that you can use to indicate all the different features of a control. Is it disabled? Is it um, required? A text box, those kind of things. And then providing the JavaScript to, to make all that kind of work together. Um, it sounds kind of challenging. Um, as you go out and you start to learn about this, you may encounter some information that seems kind of worrying when you first get it. Um, right in the uh, ARIA uh, spec and the authoring practices for 1.1, it says no ARIA is better than bad ARIA. Sounds kind of scary, why would I even try? Um, on a uh, training piece that I, I like to recommend to people, it starts off with never use ARIA unless you have to and always use ARIA when you have to, and then you're doing it wrong, probably. Um, and uh, so it, you start to read these things, you might be worried, why do I even want to touch ARIA? Well, I'm hoping that after this presentation that you'll see these less as do not enter signs, but more as like affirmations for how to use ARIA well. So where do we begin? We could look at the current specification for ARIA. Um, it's pretty new. Um, 
O of this came out in 2014, so we're, we're not talking about a very old technology. It's still pretty fluid, a lot going on. Um, the latest version 1.1 1 .1, uh, became a recommendation in uh, December um, of 2017. So uh, still pretty fresh stuff, but um, kind of like if you're gonna go learn how to, to follow your taxes, you probably don't crack open tax law. I'm not really suggesting that the specification is the first place to go, but it's definitely the place that's gonna give you all the details. There's a lot in the specification that hits a lot of different audiences. And so one of the things you'll find is that the W3C and the Web Accessibility Initiative has created a whole suite of documents out there, and so hopefully what I'm gonna do is point you in the direction of maybe which ones to look at first. Uh, so I, I recommend as far as the documents the W3C publishes is going to the using ARIA document. Um, it's very fluid, um, it's, it's being updated actively, uh, so if you look at it uh, today and you come back and look at it at a month from now, you may see some uh, changes in it. It changed even over the time that I was doing this presentation. Um, the second document that I really suggest looking at, and, and I'm gonna go over that first document in pretty good detail, and I'm gonna bring up, hopefully if the, the network's behaving, um, this document and show you some key features of it as well. Uh, to give you a sense of you know, what you would find when you look there. But um, the authoring practices, once I know about uh, how to use ARIA, and I really want to kind of get a question answered, is how exactly uh, is a certain ARIA role supposed to be used? What problems does it solve? Um, how does it provide its interaction? What users expect of it? This is the document that I actually turn to again and again especially if I'm wanting to test something that uh, someone has put on a website and I want to verify that it's working correctly, this is a document that really gives me a lot of insights as how to do it. Um, and again, I'll be bringing up a, a section of this document and kind of walking through uh, what it tells us. Um, another specification that's uh, kind of interesting and kind of useful is ARI obviously is not a technology that exists uh, on its own. It exists, um, as Leona showed, uh, right there with HTML, so we need to know how it works together. Um, and the ARI and HTML uh, spec is really what tells us that. Uh, HTML5 introduced a lot of uh, semantic uh, tags that were new to HTML. Some of those were things that ARIA uh, overlaps with, and so this is kind of a, an article that really talks how does HTML and ARIA play well together. So, that first document, using ARIA. Um, it comes with a set of five rules. The first of which is never use ARIA unless you have to. And I, I think Leona, uh, Leona talked about this a, a fair bit. Um, you know, if you can use native HTML uh, to provide certain functionality, of, say a button versus a div, then you get a lot of advantages out of that. Um, the browser's going to handle all the scripting and pieces that you'll have to do. Um, and as technology changes uh, and different hardware platforms come out, the browser's going to maintain that interactivity and, and, and do a lot of that work for you. So you're not going to have to constantly be updating and adapting your code. So that robustness comes into play, somewhat less to maintain. That extra 20% Leone talked about. Um, you would get with just the, the button. So that, it's the first rule is kind of when you can um, go ahead and uh, use what's kind of built in and get a sense of that. The second rule is not to change native semantics uh, unless you really have to. Um, and where this comes into play is that when you put an ARIA role on a tag, that's the role that that tag uh, becomes and it'll override uh, what was originally there. Um, in most cases, that may not be what you intended to do, um, but in some cases, you know, it might be. But for instance, here's a common piece that I'll, I'll find on the web. Um, landmarks, one of the series of roles that ARIA has are landmarks, so they kind of help you understand in a wireframe sense this is the banner, this is the main content, this piece 
uh, is all about navigating either the side or the page. This might be the footer. Um, and a lot of times uh, in navigation, of course, you have a series of links that maybe take you uh, to other pages on the site or a section of a site. And so we'll want to tell someone, this is the navigation, and then if they bring up their landmark list, they can jump to that and, and then quickly find the link that you know, they want to go to on your site. Um, for a long time, we've said you know, navigation uh, you know, will be in a list. Um, and what that does for assistive technology users is when they come to a list, it tells them you know, a list is beginning, it has five items. As they navigate through it, they'll hear things like you're on item one of five, item two of five. They can even skip to the end of the list. Maybe they don't want to hear all these navigation links. They want to hear what comes after it. They can jump right past it. Um, but if you put the, it'd be tempting to put that landmark role right on the list container itself the list element, but if you do what's on the left where it has um, the UL tag for an unordered list and you put role equals navigation, now that's just a div container essentially wrapping a bunch of links. And so the list will be gone um, and all you'll hear is, you know, you're in a navigation region and then you'll hear a home link, this link, and this link. Their ability to get a sense of like how many links there are before they start into it will be gone. Their ability to easily navigate past that list will be gone. Um, you know, not maybe tragically uh, inaccessible, but definitely a loss of functionality in this case. A third rule of ARIA is that all the interactive controls uh, must be usable with a keyboard. And this is usually where the challenge for developers really starts to kick in. Um, a lot of folks really aren't used to using the keyboard. Uh, they don't even uh, often know necessarily how to interact with certain things, like how do I drop down a combo list and, and set a value without uh, changing the value using just a keyboard. Um, how do radio buttons really work? How do I move through radio buttons without setting them or, or unset them, uh, for instance? Um, but a role is a promise to the user. Um, in a lot of the examples that Leone present, uh, presented, you heard Jaws say button, for instance, and there's an expectation uh, that she uh, announced is the, how a button should be used, right? You should be able to hear the name of the button and you should be able to activate it using either the space bar or the enter key. Well, with a lot of these uh, different widgets that ARIA has, you're gonna have a mental model in your mind when you hear the name of the widget. For instance, if you hear um, something like a menu, you're gonna expect a menu maybe to have multiple menu items that you can scroll through. And so you start to get an expectation of how to use it. And so it's essentially a promise. Um, Merely adding that role to the element um, doesn't uh, make the element look any different to most of us. You know, it's just an attribute there. Unless someone has attached styling and their CSS to it, it's really just gonna act the same. It's really, uh, as um, was mentioned earlier, changing the attributes that go out in that accessibility tree and then informing assistive technology as, as to what's going on. Um, but the AT user obviously is going to expect, as we're talking about, them to behave in the way that it's described. So in order to keep the promise, interactive widgets must be focusable. Um, remember in Leonie's presentation, uh, she showed a span element um, that masqueraded on the screen as a button. And initially she said, what's the keyboard experience of this? And, um, it was just silence, right? She, she couldn't tab to it, and the screen reader wouldn't announce it. Um, it's because she couldn't actually move focus to it using the tab key. And once it's on a widget, it should respond to the standard keystrokes uh, for that role in a predictable way. Again, meeting the user's memory model. You probably aren't designing some kind of a game with like a mystery meet navigation where their challenge is to figure out how do I open this secret box. You really want them to, to quickly use your site and have a pleasurable experience getting to whatever functionality it is you're, you're trying to provide. Um, so there are a wide array of different ARIA attributes and scripting necessary to make the correct behavior work. 
and there's a lot of information in the specs geared around trying to help you understand this. Um, in the ARIA practice spec, there's a whole section on building your keyboard experience, and it's definitely something to read through, um, and I will periodically read through it just to keep it kind of fresh in my head and see what changes are out there, and it, it seems like every time I learn something a little bit new. Um, so one of the things to talk about is uh, in this kind of realm is this role equals application. Um, and it's considered uh, almost like a landmark role or region role, but it has a rather drastic effect to it. And if you Google around and you look at uh, ARIA information on the web, and you, especially if you come across something from the, oh, um, you know, five, six years ago, um, a lot of times they'll tell you, you need to put this role equals application around all your ARIA. Maybe even just go ahead and put it up in the body tag. Um, and it's really unfortunate information um, because screen reading software, uh, in order to make it work, it intercepts a lot of the keyboard uh, keystrokes that users type. And those keystrokes help the user navigate around the web page, operate the web browser, operate the operating system in general, operate their screen reading technology itself. And so in essence, it's added a layer of interactivity and then it decides based upon that interactivity between the screen reading software and the user, how it's going to manipulate the object that the screen reader is trying to use. Uh, for instance, uh, on most web pages, a screen reader user can press H, and the letter H will move them from one heading to the next. They can hit Shift H, and it moves them back to the previous heading. There are all different kinds of keys. Uh, again, like I mentioned, like they can navigate a list, move between those elements, even skip past the list. Um, if you turn role equals application on um, and put that around the region, it tells the screen reader, you're handling all the keystrokes and I'm just going to pass them through to you. So it disables all those neat features that a screen reader user has where they can move through a document, move from heading to heading, for instance, and things like that. Um, because you've indicated to the assistive technology that you've got that. Um, and the only way you've really got that is if you're providing all the scripting to handle that, and we'll kind of demonstrate that. Um, typically, you're not going to need role equals application um, unless you're creating something really wild like a, a, a totally uh, accessible arcade game or you're trying to emulate the old original Apple IIe in a web page or, or something like that where you really need to take over the whole interface and do something totally different. Um, I haven't seen a, an actual valid use of role equals application on a, on a website yet outside of some emulator. Um, most of the screen reading tags, though, do implement some form of this. So if you're creating a menu and the expectation is I can move around in a menu using arrow keys and, and hit escape and a lot of things like that, your script obviously can't implement that kind of behavior if it can't get to those keystrokes. So Certain ARIA tags like menu bar, menu, and, and things like that will tell an assistive technology when the user actually gets to this control, don't intercept those keystrokes, but pass them directly to me. And so it, it's all kind of handled automatically now. Um, and again, if, if you ever see a need to use role application, you, you might really want to check that with somebody and make sure that that's correct. So one of the challenges, um, that we'll end up coming across is just kind of the misuse of an ARIA role. Um, and so here, role equals menu bar. It, it sounds logical. Um, sometimes people will do this just to document it, or maybe they'll end up saying, hey, this is really a cool way to, to put my CSS selectors to use. Um, but it's not really acting like a, a menu bar here. Um, a lot of times, roles actually work in concert with other roles. So going back to that, you know, the, the aria singing with the support of the orchestra, menu bar works with uh, menu items. Maybe there'll actually be buttons on the menu bar. Um, there'll be submenus and, and all of that. A menu bar in itself would ex kind of make a promise that there would be something in there that you would interact with. And so you'd be looking for other aria roles inside of it. Um, but when a screen reader comes across this, it's going to say, you know, menu bar, 
and then they're just going to end up hearing link, you know, link, link, and, and all this. But it, it's not going to actually have the submenu items and all those that the user would expect. So suddenly they're going to be confused and kind of misled. So the fourth role of a rule of ARIA use um, is not to use rule of presentation or um, ARIA hidden on a visible and focusable element. Um, for instance, here, um, a button with ARIA hidden equal to true, um, and it's still really available out there in the DOM. It's a button, so it, it's natively keyboard accessible, right? Um, so a user could tab to this um, with a screen reader because it's, it's still in the tab order, um, but it won't actually announce anything. It'll be silent because the screen reader's told there's nothing there. Um, so they've essentially hit a black hole. Um, and if you put a lot of controls on the page uh, that are either under ARIA hidden or other means of hiding, um, then the screen reader is going to end up just tab trying to move around and, and could actually get stuck or just assume their screen reader has crashed. Um, so the fifth rule, um, I put these rules in the order that they're in the ARIA document. I, I always kind of think of this one as the obvious first hit, like do this first. Um, all interactive elements must have an accessible name. Um, you know, imagine if we all walked around and, um, you know, and, and this piece was empty and you could just see that you're just a participant um, and I wanted to address someone and I would have to, you know, like, well, participant, the fifth one in the row. Well, that's kind of what um, screen reading technology will do. And one of the worst things you can hear as you're tabbing through a form, maybe when you're trying to make an airline reservation or a hotel reservation or, or catch the shuttle to Indianapolis is unlabeled button. Um, and so you've tabbed to a control or you've brought up a list and it just says unlabeled button and you're like, is this the one that gives me a 10% discount or is this the button that cancels my order or is this the one that decides I'm going to like really get 10 of these and, and I'm going to end up with a really big bill? You don't know, right? Um, so everything has to have a name. Um, so, you know, essentially if, if you create a control and you give it a role like button and maybe you've implemented all the other CSS to make it look like a button and, and scripting, but if you don't put a name on it, Again, it's just going to come up as button. So how do we label it? Um, well, there's the ARIA label attribute here all the way on, on the right-hand side, ARIA-label. And in this case, um, delete. And so this span is now indicating that it's a button. It's in the tab order because we have tab index equal to zero. So I can use my keyboard to navigate to it. Um, and it has an ID, maybe that's being used to assign uh, scripting to it or, or styling, but it's going to be announced as a delete button. Um, but what is it actually going to delete? Um, a lot of times you'll end up getting something, maybe it's a whole table of, of items, and there'll be a delete button for every single entry in it. Um, you'd really like to know what delete, what, what's actually going to be deleted when I click on this. So, Maybe this is actually my Amazon order and I'm wanting to, to delete this item off of my cart. Um, and so there's another ARIA attribute called ARIA described by, which is really useful for adding extra contextual information. And in the past, a lot of times developers uh, would do things like put title attributes on uh, buttons or links that provide a little extra description. Well, this is similar to that, except for um, the ARIA described by, um, you put in an ID of another element that contains the text that's providing the extra description. So um, it's still a button, it still has the, the name delete, but a user can find out more information either by dwelling on that button for a longer period of time or hitting the special key to find out that it's going to delete chia seeds. Um, and so you can be really more specific than uh, users will see delete, um, and visually they can probably align it to the element that you're removing. But for folks that can't see that visual alignment, you can tie that information together with the ARIA described by and help make that label uh, more unique on the page. So there's a lot to accessible name calculations. 
and adding in those descriptions, and it can get really complex depending on uh, all the different features of a control and all the different uh, child attributes or child elements and, and other attributes that are present. Um, there's a really um, intricate and kind of scary spec um, where it's the accessible name and description computation 1.1. It's kind of a mind bender to look at. Um, I tried to absorb it sometimes. I once upon a time had written an accessibility testing tool and really had to struggle with, you know, how do I decide how to report the name of something to someone as, you know, assistive technology is supposed to see it. Um, so I, I found a, kind of an easier, a simpler to digest uh, article at Simply Accessible blog has demystifying accessible names. Um, and it's uh, definitely something to go look at if you're trying to figure out how do all these different attributes combine into forming a name and a, um, a description. And so a lot of times, you know, if you have an image link and the, the image itself has an alt attribute and maybe you have a title on the, the link that's the parent wrapped around that image and then um, you wanted to put an ARIA label on that, you know, do you put it on the image? Do you put it on the link? What's really going to be the result of all that? Um, these specs really kind of help you understand uh, what the outcome is going to be and, and help you drive how you actually code uh, providing the right accessible name. So Leonie Watson um, kind of <clears throat> introduced the idea of, of design patterns. Um, and this is uh, one of the pieces that I really kind of wanted to focus on. It, to me, it's really, it really ties everything together. It's um, the idea of the, the conductor and the person who orchestrated the score and, and put it all together. How, do all, how does all this work together? So as I mentioned earlier, certain rules only make sense when used in combination to form a complex widget. Um, and I brought up the example of a menu bar. Um, you'd probably expect there might be buttons or other submenus on the menu bar. Um, ARIA has global attributes uh, that can be applied to any HTML element. And so um, you can put uh, those global elements even on a, an HTML element that doesn't have a role, for instance. Um, but other attributes only make sense in particular roles. And so when you actually go out, and I think uh, Leone had some slides with there are all these different types of roles and there are all these different attributes, and it sounds kind of like a, a big landscape to get your head around. Um, the, the way you really kind of get a sense of, of how it all comes together is, is to look at these design practices. Um, the document will describe for any given ARIA widget, um, like a menu or an accordion or a tab panel, um, all the different roles, their parent-child relationships, what needs to control what, um, what keyboard uh, interactions that the user would be expecting, um, and what they do at all the different states. Um, and it really kind of puts it all together. And so what I wanted to do, if, uh, if I can bring up the web page for that, and so let's hope the network is working. is bring up an example out of a design pattern. And so if you went to the um, ARIA practices document and you went to the design pattern section, you would see a long list of all these different patterns, the you know, accordions, uh, radio buttons, all these different things that you could build using ARIA. And this is the menu bar example that I've been constantly mentioning. Um, in all these specs, um, you can report issues and in case you think that you found a bug um, or something like that. Um, you can find related issues uh, to it or you can go back to um, the original specification uh, entry for this particular design pattern. Um, but it will give you an explanation of you know, what this particular design pattern is trying to do what the ARIA uh, roles uh, problem is really kind of trying to solve. And then it builds an actual example. And so as you can see uh, here, there's a menu bar. 
Um, I can use my mouse to hover over it. It looks a lot like those mega menus you might see on the top of some websites or just navigation bars you'll see where, you know, there are certain entries going across in a horizontal bar. Um, they kind of stand out. There's little icons next to the entries in there for about admissions and academics. It's kind of a down pointing triangle that indicates that you could probably guess that there's sub menus under that. And indeed, when I use the mouse, I can hover over all of these and see it. Um, I could click on programs of study and it you know, would take me to um, basically you know, the, the default page that handles the menu so they can demonstrate it's working. Um, but how does that work with a keyboard, for instance? Um, so if I were to tab into this, I can tab right through it. Well, one of the things, um, so I tab to the first entry in the menu bar and it highlights, it shows visible focus. And then I hit tab again and I, I drop down to a link further down on the page. Um, and so that may be unexpected for some users um, because maybe they don't understand ARIA or they're not used to, to seeing complex widgets in a page. But really what I need to do is once I've tabbed into the ARIA widget, I can now use my arrow keys um, so I'm hitting the right arrow key and it's just cycling between the entries in that widget. I can use the down arrow keys to actually pull down a menu. I can open a submenu, um, for, um, a menu item in there uh, using the right arrow key. I can close that using the left arrow key. I can hit escape and, and, and close the submenu as well, move back to the menu bar. Um, Again, um, one of the benefits of ARIA is it really provides multi-dimensional navigation. I don't just have to tab through everything. Suddenly I can use arrow keys and other more complex navigation means to be much more efficient. Um, but also with screen reading technology, it's actually going to announce it as a menu bar. And it should behave essentially in the same way that if you were to open up the menu of any of your favorite, say, Windows application and start going through the, the menu entries in the, the menu bar at the top of the application. So how do we make all that work and, and pull that all together? Um, so keyboard support, it'll have a long description of what should happen when uh, with this. Um, so they tell you that the space and the inner key should open the submenu and move focus to the first item in the submenu. So let's try that. I can come back up here and I can hit tab and I should be able to hit the space bar and indeed the menu does open and it takes me to the first item in that. And so if I'd had a memory model in my head that I could tab to this use the arrow key to move to the menu item I want, say admissions, and then I know I can open that using the, the space bar. And so, um, seems to prove out. Um, but there are a lot of different ways to, uh, I'm not used to this touchpad, sorry, um, to use a menu bar. Um, and then they kind of break it down into subcomponents. There are submenus that might behave in a slightly different way as well. Um, so then there are, of course, all the different ARIA roles that come together to make this work. There is the menu bar itself. There are the menu items contained inside of the menu bar, each of those individual entries. There are all the different attributes uh, and how they're used, what they indicate when they change value. Um, and perhaps you know, how they should work together as the state changes. And again, listed both for the menu bar and, and the submenu. Um, and then a kind of a beautiful piece of design patterns as well is that they will show you um, the actual source code and all the JavaScript that it takes to implement this. Um, when I was growing up and um, my dad stuck computers in front of me, you know, that. The way I learned to make them work was I always just wanted to see the code, and so I would just go dig into the code. And I think it's kind of one of the best ways if I'm an app developer or you know, trying to figure something out, you know, I 
I'll go to GitHub or something like that and, and try to look at, you know, how are things coded? Well, this is an amazing resource on uh, their site um, in the spec that essentially for all the different uh, common widgets that they could think of, um, what they do, how they should behave, um, all the different roles and properties that you need to use, how they work together, um, and then even example scripting that you can take a look at. Um, and so as a developer, uh, you can figure out, is this even the right uh, role that I need to apply? Um, what all I really need to handle? If I'm a QA person trying to test an app, I can go in and look, you know, what do I need to exercise to find out if my developing team has put this together correctly? Um, if I'm an accessibility professional trying to test something that a vendor's given me or maybe someone else at my company has developed, then I can go in and make sure that um, it's behaving according to plan. Oh, for some reason the web browser is coming back up. So there are other design pattern libraries. Another one that I like um, is DQ's code library um, at dquuniversity.com uh, forward slash library. Um, and then, of course, Leonie Watson uh, presented hers a little bit earlier, and you can find it on her tink.uk site. Um, but it's design-patterns.tink.uk. Um, and they provide a lot of similar information. Um, and so one caveat I would bring to this is um, beware of bad examples on the web. Um, I won't narc uh, this particular one out, but a major uh, uh, web browser provider provides this example as to how to make uh, ARIA buttons accessible um, in their uh, ARIA help information. Uh, can anybody see what's wrong with this? Uh, I was playing off of a piece that Leonie Watson brought up in her presentation as well. So um, essentially, this is a uh, on key down event handler that's handling keystrokes that bubble up through the, the whole document. And it's basically looking to see if uh, key code 13 has been pressed, which um, any fellow geeks out there know that key code 13 is the inner key or the uh, carriage return uh, on the keyboard. Um, and then if it sees that the uh, key code 13 or the inner key has been pressed, essentially, then it's going to raise the on-click uh, event on whatever element has focus at the moment. And so essentially, it's only going to react to the enter key and not the space bar as well. And um, a lot of users will expect that they can just hit the space bar uh, to activate a button. And so they might tab to it using the left hand and want to use their right hand to hit the space bar. Or maybe the space bar is just more attracted to them for whatever reason. It's a larger target. Um, but this is not going to make that work. And then they may start to wonder, well, you know, is that a button actually work at all? So how do we test once we've built something? Um, one of the first things, and, and it seems like it's almost kind of not a thing anymore, but uh, when I first started coding for the web, I always validated my pages to see if I was doing things correctly, um, at least from a markup standpoint. Um, well, there is a W3C new markup a validation service that has ARIA awareness built into it. Um, so it can help you find things um, like misspellings of labeled by. Um, I always thought the labeled by uh, attribute spelling, um, which is ARIA-L-A-B-E-L-L-E-B-Y, as opposed to what I would expect it to be, which was um, with just one L, so ARIA-L-A-B-E-L-E. Um, D B Y, and so I was always typing it the more like English spelling, and apparently they used the UK spelling. Um, so I would mistype it, um, and of course, uh, browsers and technology being really specific as such things um, don't take kindly to misspellings, and they would just ignore that 
Um, so a validator would go through and, and find um, all those kind of things and point them out to you. Um, and still pretty useful, even if you're not validating the rest of your code, you can find um, misuse of ARIA um, roles that aren't properly nested or missing certain key attributes and things like that. Um, the new uh, HTML validator is actually pretty good at, at pulling those out. Sometimes you actually want to just be able to do that right in the web browser. Um, so there are, of course, uh, plugins that you can put into your web browser that will help you uh, take a deep look at your code. A free one um, that I like to use a lot is the DQ Axe uh, browser plugin. It actually works in a lot of environments, and you can even automate it in your testing platforms. Um, but there is a nice plugin for uh, Firefox and Chrome. It sits right there in your developer tools. So if you right click on some code and hit inspect, it's going to be there and able to analyze your page. Um, you probably can't read any of this, but essentially what it is is, is a view of a web page um, with a uh, ARIA menu bar. Um, not to beat that example in, into the ground, but um, I brought up a, a design pattern um, that didn't seem to be working correctly on a certain site. Um, I'm not sure if it's just not complete or, or what's going on, but it, it had a lot of problems with it. And that when I went into the Axe Checker, I told it to analyze the page. Sure enough, it came up with a lot of problems. Um, and uh, so one of the things it's actually showing is an invalid attribute value. The attribute's not invalid, um, the ARIA controls, um, but it's pointing to a non-existent ID. So it's not actually going to be able to describe. And the reason it's not existent is because the, the developer put in a pound sign in front of the ID as if they were entering it in a uh, CSS selector, when really all it's expecting is the actual name of the ID. Um, and so that's the whole reason why um, that wasn't working. Um, but you know, a simple mistake, easy mistake to make, but something that a uh, tool like this can point out to you, you know, and it's 2 a.m. and you're sleepy and you've coded for way too long. These tools come in very helpful. Um, the A Inspector sidebar uh, works in Firefox. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't work in Firefox 57 and on, so you have to kind of get the enterprise extended support version of Firefox and, and run it. They have information on their um, GitHub site on, on how to do that, how to get the earlier versions of Firefox and run them safely. Um, but it's a really useful tool also as well for kind of fleecing your code. Um, checking the accessibility DOM and tree. Um, Remember all that, uh, how do I make my accessible name and description work? Sometimes you uh, want to kind of find out, um, did you do that correctly? Um, and you'd love to be able to look in the accessibility DOM and, and just see it pretty quickly rather than have to fire up the screen reader and figure out how to use it and see what it says and then uh, maybe try it and then a few others. Um, so Chrome and, and Firefox both make this pretty easy to do. Uh, Again, if you right-click something and you go into your familiar element inspector, um, if you scroll over all the way uh, to the side, sometimes often hidden on the far right, if you don't have the window open enough, there will actually be an accessibility entry in the properties that you can see. So instead of looking at the styles or the computed styles, uh, you can actually pull up the accessibility tree. And if I have an element highlighted, I can actually go in and, and pull up all the ARIA attributes that have been applied to it, um, read and see if those have come across. And the computed property's name will actually be right there. Um, and so if you want to see how it's come out, if you've done your interpretation of the spec correctly, um, you can do it very quickly with just a right click and a, a couple clicks uh, with your mouse. So going back to that original using ARIA uh, guidance document that the W3C has out there, um, they have a custom control checklist, which is kind of, to me, like all the different things I need to think of all wrapped into one uh, when I'm putting an ARIA uh, widget together. Um, and so I think it kind of makes a nice summary. Um, you know, I need to make sure it's focusable. 
I can actually use my tab key, other means to, to bring uh, input focus to it. I provide a clear indication of focus. It, it doesn't really do much good to move focus to it if you can't see that that's where focus is. Remember in the menu, there was the really dark entry in the menu bar that kind of showed you where the active element in the menu was. Um, it's keyboard operable. Um, that means I can actually use those things like the arrow keys and escape key and home and end and page down and, and all those different things to, to navigate it as I should. Touch operable, these days everybody wants to, to use their uh, phone in their pocket to access information or even their, their iPads. Um, a lot of the ARIA widgets um, can be easily made and natively touch a support Expected operations, so you know they work according to the standard. Again, if I'm non-visual and you're telling me that something is uh, a menu bar, then you know I'm going to have to take your word for it and then start pressing the keys to make it the work the way that I think it should. Um, the accessible name, so I know what it does. Um, the, the appropriate role, the correct states and properties, so that everything is indicated correctly. Um, you know, sufficient color contrast and supports high contrast modes are, are kind of basic pieces of what I think of as just standard accessibility. But, you know, they really kind of fall into these complex widgets where, you know, you're not maybe totally sure that you've seen it before. And so, you know, if you're a keyboard only user with low vision and you're trying to understand how something works, you want to make sure it's pretty obvious of what's going on visually uh, as well. But again, in that using ARIA document in the checklist section, uh, it talks more about a lot of this. Um, testing using only the keyboard, you know, put away the mouse and, and try these. Can you navigate to and operate all the site features? Leonie talked about this. One thing that you might not know if you're a Mac developer is that by default, um, you're not using assistive technology. It, it's not keyboard accessible by default. I'm not really sure why Apple does this. I don't think it gets in the way if you're not using the keyboard. Um, but you actually have to go turn keyboard accessibility on. Um, and it varies in the different operating systems, but in your system preferences panel, there's a keyboard entry. Um, and you'll find things like um, press tab to highlight each item in the web page. Um, and you'd want to turn that on because um, by default, tabs are going to skip over fun things like buttons. And, and I don't know why they thought that was smart, but I'm sure there's a reason. I'm just not aware of what it is. Um, other browsers in the Mac OS, um, uh, you can do that as well. Um, we only talked about testing with different assistive technologies. One of the things in higher ed is, you know, we're always hearing when we ask people to test their stuff is, well, what screen reader do I use? I can only use one. Um, nowadays, students are coming, um, and they're not just using Windows. Um, we have a lot of voiceover users on their phone. Almost every blind student we work with here has an iPhone, um, and they expect things to work with it. We even have a couple students that don't use a desktop at all. All they use really is their iPhone. Um, for instance, a uh, student coming from another country where their screen reading or the, the JAWS screen reading technology in Windows doesn't really work well with their language, um, but iOS works better, and so that's all they really want to use. Um, the next thing that we would think of is the NVDA screen reader on Windows. It's starting to be pretty common. It has some areas where it actually works better than everything else. So students will frequently switch between NVDA and their other screen reader of choice, just depending on what they need to do. Um, Dragon Naturally Speaking, uh, we actually have a lot more licenses of Dragon Naturally Speaking checked out and loaned out across the university than screen readers by far. Um, you know, people will clean their gutters and fall off the ladder, have too much adventure at spring break. Um, or have other issues that cause them not to be able to effectively use their arms and hands to control their computer. Um, testing with Dragon um, and Aria, pretty much all Dragon pays attention to is that name. So you want to be able to know what the name of something is, so Dragon will allow you to say, click search, click begin, click next. 
uh, and all those kind of pieces. So the accessible name is really important there. Um, the one piece that I've learned from that is it pays attention to the ARIA label. Um, but be really careful if you have an icon that um, says go and you have that in a search pattern, but your ARIA label says search. Visually, it says go, so the Dragon Naturally Speaking user is going to be saying click go, click go. Um, but if your ARIA uh, accessible name is search, you know, Dragon's not going to understand that go means search. So um, be careful to keep things consistent. Um, talk back on Android, uh, we still don't know of any students using that, but now it's built into Android. It's a lot easier to use. Um, it's cheaper, so I would expect at some point we would see that, but it's definitely still not as powerful as a voiceover on iOS. Um, there are some really great documents out there on how to test using uh, screen readers. Um, as Leone said, don't maybe trust your first results with that because they are really complicated to use. Um, WebAIM has a really nice article on you know, what it's like to use a screen reader and how to think about it and, and all the keystrokes. DQ has put together a um, screen reader's resource page for all the different screen readers, all the different keystrokes you need to use, and a little summary, again, of how to think about what it's like to use a screen reader. Um, where else can you get training? Um, so sometimes you got to get those early singing lessons before you can make a beautiful sound. Um, there's a self-paced training that I like to recommend. It's the DQ University site. Um, they break it down into a lot of different courses. There are two on their site in particular that deal with ARIA, uh, kind of an introduction to it, and then more of a, a complex JavaScript and ARIA type of a training. They're self-paced, you, you, know, you pay a little bit of money for access to a course or a whole collection of courses. Um, it's usually $45 to access a particular course for a year and it gets cheaper as you package them together. Um, as far as interactive online type courses, um, University of Illinois offers a badging program that actually has ARIA as one of its badges, but also covers a lot of other accessibility topics. Um, and of course, if you're really uh, young and, and out there in the job field or even an experienced person like me, you might find a case where you want to kind of prove to someone that you really know your stuff. Um, so being able to get certification uh, is kind of important. There is a uh, industry um, called the uh, International Association of Accessibility Professionals, so an industry group. Um, that they've come up with two levels currently of, of certification. Um, the first level of certification talks a lot about, you know, what is disability, what is accessibility, what is assistive technology, how does all that kind of work together, what are the laws, not just in the United States, but internationally, what does the United Nations have to say about disability and, and all those pieces. Um, and then they have the Web Accessibility Specialist, the WAS certification, which as a developer would be a good one to get. Um, and so if you're wanting to really kind of uh, prove to someone that um, at least you've got a pretty broad sense of what this is all about and, and can speak competently on it um, and put some effort in, then I would recommend going for these certifications. And then again, like I said, um, the badging program at the University of Illinois, you actually can get a badge. Uh, from that, the traditional badge that you, know, you could plug into LinkedIn and, and things like that. Well, thanks a lot for watching. Um, I really hope this presentation has helped you make a little bit more sense of ARIA, where you can go to actually start learning it, how to put it all together, where you can get some of your questions answered.